I think we'll get started. Um, almost everyone on the list is here and a few extras, so that's awesome. Can everybody hear me? If you're sitting way in the back, can you hear me? Okay. Um, okay, I'm such pretty comfortable without a microphone. If for some reason it feels really quiet, let us know. We do have a microphone. Um, just tends to make it a little bit. Oh, <laughs> um, so thank you for coming. I know I see a lot of familiar faces that have heard this spiel before, so just bear with me. Uh, my name is Melissa. I'm the volunteer coordinator here. Um, so I work very closely with our awesome volunteers, and I also help plan some of these public programs like the lecture today. Um, is there anyone sitting here that has not been here before? A few. Okay, great, great. So we're the Great Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. We're part of a national system, so there are 30 reserves all around the country. The closest one to us is the Wells Reserve in Lodholm. Um, a lot of people have been there, so you're probably very familiar with that. Um, and our newest reserve um, just got designated in Connecticut, um, and hopefully one in Louisiana will be coming online soon, so we're growing our numbers. Um, every reserve is um, part federal and then um, also has like a state or local partner. So the federal partner is NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and then our state partner is New Hampshire Fish and Game. So um, most of the staff members, like you'll see, we have um, Fish and Game shirts on. We're all Fish and Game employees. This is a Fish and Game property. Um, and the reserve encompasses about 10,000 acres around Great Bay, um, about 3,000 acres of land and 7,000 acres of water, um, approximately. And uh, we do a lot of different things from K through 12 education, teacher education, um, helping to teach local decision makers about some new science or new regulations that are rolling out, um, research all along the bay, uh, land stewardship to help protect and maintain the lands around the bay. Um, and what am I missing? Stewardship research, CTP. No, I, I think I got it all. Uh, so. Anyways, and we do a lot here um, at this particular site because it's kind of where all the offices are. So this is where you'll see the most activity, but we do have other properties that are open to the public as well. So just, you know, afterwards, if you have any questions, let me know. And our website's really easy to remember. It's just greatbay.org. So if you leave here and you're like, oh shoot, I can't remember where I was. Um, hopefully you can remember that website. <laughs> so um, today we have an awesome speaker, Dr. Pam Hunt with New Hampshire Audubon. And she uh, is definitely a, a bird expert and we're really lucky to have her. Um, she has been working at Audubon since about 2000, but she's been interested in birds since she was about 12 years old. Um, and she has her PhD from Dartmouth College. And today she's gonna to talk about winter backyard birds in New Hampshire. Um, and we are recording this lecture. So if you ask a question, uh, the camera might pan to you, but you're you know, a little far away. So I wouldn't be too worried about, you know, if you're like playing hooky at work or something, maybe you wanna hide in the back, but otherwise you should be fine. Thank you very much. I haven't even talked yet. You don't know what's going to be any good. <laughs> Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All right, so welcome. Um, yes, as you know, I'm Pam Bunt. I'm from Audubon. Who here is a member of Audubon? Nice. Okay, we won't have to lock the doors. <laughs> I'm not going to click on people who aren't because that's a pretty good ratio. Pretty ratio. All right, so. Um, it is winter, um, especially tomorrow night. So we're going to talk about um, population trends um, on birds of New Hampshire in the winter. It's based on a project done called the Backyard Winter Bird Survey. Um, who here has done the New Hampshire's Backyard Winter Bird Survey? Excellent. We can get more of you involved after this, probably. Um, I brought some materials with me. People want to join up. Um, just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about. Where are the data? I just mentioned one of them. Um, we're going to look at a lot of graphs, um, tell a few stories with each of those graphs, and hopefully there'll be time for random bird-related questions. There always is, and there always are, <laughs> and, you know, stuff like that. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, start off this program, back to what the bird survey has been going on since 1967. Um, started with cardinals, chipmunks, and mockingbirds, which at that point were still very rare in New Hampshire, moving in. 
Um, we expanded it in 1987 um, to include all species. It's held the second weekend of February. This year is the 11th and 12th. That website will be again at the end. You can write it down or pick up a thing, whatever you need to do. So that's one source of data. People count the birds on that weekend. We get the data, we pile it in, and I get to play with it. The other source is the Christmas bird count. Who's done a Christmas bird count? Oh. <laughs> Just the person who doesn't say she's a birder. <laughs> um, I'll pick out certain people here. Um, so no, there's a bunch of these across the country. Um, New Hampshire has 23 of them. They're 15 mile diameter circles. Um, I probably haven't changed this talk. The nearest, well, there's one right here. Oh yeah, there's two. I did fix it this talk. I'm pretty amazing. <laughs> there's two that cover part of the Great Bay, the coastal one and the Lee Durham one. Um, I'm not gonna use data from those particular counts today, but I might have Christmas bird count data. And that's people going out in that circle all day long, down the dusk as much as they want, counting everything, it gets piled up in the end and put in a big pile. So those are just, those are the two main sources of data we have for what populations of birds are doing in the wintertime. So let's just jump right into this. This is a cardinal. You all knew that, hopefully. And as I said, this species was really scarce in the state when we started this. They were here. They'd been here for maybe five to 10 years, depending on where in the state. They were all in the southern part of the state, mostly Seacoast, Merrimack Valley, Connecticut Valley, but they've just been cranking up since then, full of number of birds. Now, I'm not going to mention this all the time, and most of that doesn't make a difference, but there's also been more people doing it now than they used to do it. So there is, if anybody's a statistician, you're going to say, Pam, that's full of crap. It's just more people, because the number of people has gone up significantly. Sometimes I'll show graphs where they get divided by a number of people. That's the number of people there. So it's the exact same graph. So the problems actually haven't increased at all, right? This, this <laughs> event. Um, it's tricky to do some of the math here. Um, but if you do it um, per observer, there's a really weird glitch at the beginning. And that just might be because there were so few observers and they were all where the cardinals were. So there was nobody <laughs> doing info. I, I haven't been able to break those data down. But then you can see starting in the you know, 80s or so, there's just, even per observer, it's going up a little bit. You can break it out even farther, but I compare the north and the south. So the north is Grafton, Carroll, and Coas counties, way up in the boonies. South is everything else. And you can still see going up, going up, slowly but surely. Um, but if you actually want one more graph, most of them don't have five graphs. Um, so I figured I'd just pick cardinal because everybody likes cardinals. There's also something called the Breeding Bird Survey, which is done in June. And that's been going on since 66. And that's standardized data. That's, that's not like, that's just number of birds on a 25 mile route. So you can't fudge it by like tweaking a 50 mile route out there. They're having extra people. So it's a single route. And that shows that same data going up very, very nice. And these are both Christmas bird count in red and the backyard bird survey in blue. And these are all relative abundance. So that also takes account of the number of observers for those two. So they're all going up. And the scales are different just because it's a different way of counting them. So cardinals are just going up. We are not worried about cardinals. Onward. What's this one? This one. Excellent. You see, when I give this talk and like there's like the garden club and there's refreshments, like give people extra cookies. <laughs> but you guys have to get your own cookies. <laughs> or I don't know if anybody's got over back in the, the offices, they might have a cookie to give out to somebody. <laughs> Same pattern, right? There's our tipmost, you know, almost none. All over the place, it's record high this last year. Mockingbird. This side of the room is the head. <laughs> <laughs> Mockingbird is a weird one. It shows this really dramatic increase right off the bat and then basically decline and it's leveled up. And no one's really sure why that's happened. Um, it shows up in the breeding bird survey data as well and the Christmas count data. Um, they, are, they like hanging out in little fruit trees in the winter, eating multiflora rose or crab apples or whatever else. And there's plenty of food around. They've obviously adapted to the cold weather. So why was this decline happening for 20 years? If someone still has time to get a PhD or something, they want to do that. There's a project for you. We added morning doves pretty early on too, because actually, if you didn't realize this, morning doves are somewhat migratory. So they were kind of moving into the state and staying longer in the winters back when all this was going on, but the data doesn't show that. <laughs> they were already, they up, they're up and down. That's probably mostly related to just how severe the winter is. Um, they'll move out if there's 
colder or less fluid around, even if, even if the feeders are active. So not a much of a good story there, so we'll skip the rest of that. Okay, these are some of my favorites. Red-bellied. Red-bellied woodpecker and? And again, that side of the room is way ahead. <laughs> if I stand there, they'll be scared and you guys will answer that. So these are the new invaders. Back when I first moved to New Hampshire, red-bellied woodpeckers were not here, period. This was in 1989, 1990. A pair showed up in Hollis like that first winter or second winter I lived here, and birders from all over the state drove to Beaver Brook Association to see a red bug woodpecker. Now you can step out here and probably hear three or four after we've popped so far. Um, so here we go. Carolina Wren, same deal. They were rare until the 90s. And you can see, they, you know, there's none. And then in the 90s, they start popping up, and then they just, red bellies particularly took off like gangbusters. Wrens are a little slower. Um, the really cool thing about wrens, well, not cool if you're a wren, <laughs> is this drop here. That's because wrens are not as cold tolerant as lots of other birds. They, they're probably adapting as they move north, and of course, it's getting warmer. But during really cold winters, wrens will have higher than usual mortality. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're at a feeder, they're a little better off because they've got a food source. But that drop was after a you know, learning the cold winds of the road dropped down and they took a little while to recover and now they're back, moving back up again. So these two species are the new cardinals and titmice. Um, and they're getting up into Southern Coas County now. There's records most years now for Southern Coas County. There was a bunch of red bellies up in Lancaster area back in November, December. They sort of had lots of kids. Those kids dispersed. Some of them found co-ops and said, maybe I'll hang out here and maybe they'll die. Next year, we'll find out. Maybe we'll find out in February. Muja. Oh, well done! <laughs> yes! <laughs> They're gonna get harder, right? I'm gonna start <laughs> so, what do Blue Jays do? Make so, noise. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's an action. They go up and down a lot. <laughs> um, there was a recent little question on the New Hampshire birders email list like a few days ago saying, where's all my blue jays gone? And I answered them saying they're just gone. <laughs> they come back and forth. But some people then it started a whole thing with, well, I have blue jays. I don't, I do. And it's like 40 <laughs> people just start chirping in about their blue jays. And Chirping. you can see this is a very regular up and down, up and down, and up and down. And the idea is, and that's not just noise. That is actually a biological phenomenon. So the chance for this side room to get points <laughs> is to say, why is that? Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, you, you're a tough crowd. <laughs> they lose points now. They're just asking you. Food source. Food source. It's acorns. Ah. Uh, the acorns and beech nuts and other masting crops to cope it down. And when there's not many acorns, blue jays will just leave, mm -hmm. they will migrate. You'll see flocks of blue jays migrating overhead in October. Um, and this year there were lots of them doing that and they've you know, moved out of lots of areas. There are small spots that may be finding a good source of food. They'll hang out, they'll stay there. So that number I'm predicting um, this next February, a week, a month now will be lower than it was last year. And I've been wrong about that a lot. So let's see what happens. <laughs> Okay, now here's the quiz. Which one is which? And I, I did put on the scale, so that was a hint. But yeah, so we got downy and hairy woodpeckers, um, Dowell and Hollow, and you can see they're increasing. Not a big story here, they're just increasing. It might be because they're adapting to forest, more forest, forest is regrowing in the state, um, but they also don't mind yards. So they're just a couple of species that are doing nice. Not a big story there. They're always fun. And whose who's bird is who's who's no, no, I'm asking state birds who's yeah, no, 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 who has this as their favorite bird? That I was trying to say, nobody, oh, okay, but I thought about that. Um, there we go, but they're up and down a lot too. They also migrate, you might, yeah, and those people don't know this. So the chickadees you have. In your feeders now, or the blue jays might not be the same ones that you have in the summer. 
because they move around a little bit. Not all, some years more than other years, and sometimes this food supplies, it's hard to say, but they go up and down. There's a, there was a slight concern about a little decline, but they're just, they're just all within that range. Just a little, little, little friends. <laughs> and more little friends, white breasted and red breasted have not hatch. Oh yeah. Um, but look at that. So really red is red. <laughs> So white's like the downy woodpeckers and yearly woodpeckers are just slowly going up, you know, something's going on with these forest birds. But these little red breasts are like back down again. Okay. Um, anyone know what that's called? Eruption. Spike. Eruption. 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 I R R, not eruption. So there's no lava involved. <laughs> um, this is called the We'll talk more about eruptions in a second, but this is when bird populations that don't normally get down in a certain part of the world will suddenly just leave Canada largely en masse to find food because the food supply in Canada has tanked. So we've had two really big red breasted nuthatches here that you can see. One was just two years ago, they were everywhere. You couldn't throw a rock without taking out two or three of them. <laughs> and then they dropped back down, and this year they're, you know, and the year before there were almost none in some places. So they go up and down basically right through spruce cones. So in the north, where they mostly breed up in the northern forests, they eat lots of spruce seeds. And when the spruce crop is poor, then they, they move south. Don't go. All right, you guys are getting quicker. <laughs> <laughs> so you have buzzer? Yeah, we need a buzzer. Oh, that'd be teams. I'll do that. I'll give you a second to all the room divided into teams. <laughs> So juncos, um, interesting, show something of an increase, but they also show that same very dramatic um, ups and downs. Do I have a picture of the junco? No, I don't. So I'll have to tell the story without, without a graph. I was just at a talk in at a bird conference in Massachusetts last October, and someone was doing a study of juncos in the Berkshires, where they were banding them all, color banding them, so they have little plastic colors on their legs. You can tell which one's which. And they found over the course of the two years of the study that the juncos that were there in the winter were a mix of both juncos that disappeared in the spring to go back up in, to the north and juncos that bred nearby. And then the juncos in the summer were a mix of juncos that were there all year and juncos that came back north from somewhere south. So at, the, at a given point in the year, they've got three or four different groups of juncos all mingling together. So the birds, like I go with the chickadees, the birds you see your feeders in December and January are, might not be the same ones that you see in your feeders, if you shouldn't have your feeders out in summer anyway, um, those are some big furry things. I should put a picture in here off a of bear. <laughs> but so the, junk, so the birds are doing things that we don't always know they're doing because we don't always tell individuals apart. The juncos are probably eruptive, just like the nuthatches and stuff where, you know, look at that. Um, this year, they're really scarce, at least in concrete. So I'm guessing that's gonna go that way. All right, the quizzes are gonna get a little harder here. No, tree sparrow. tree sparrow, American tree sparrow. Chipping sparrows are not here in the winter. Very, very, very rare. Tree sparrows have this little black dot in their breast. They have a really big wing bar. They have the same little rusty hat, hat, hat. But tripping sparrows don't have that in the winter. It's a common mistake. Um, so this is an American tree sparrow. They also have a yellow bill. This is our winter sparrow. They breed on the tundra, which is in the roof. <laughs> um, up in the tundra of Canada, and they come south in the winter. It's one of the few birds that's not a water bird that we get in the winter that's not a nest or anywhere nearby. And they're declining significantly. Um, CBC data going all the way back to the 60s, and then Christmas count data, I mean, back to when the birth rate data started in the 80s. Very, very significant. You can even see the ups and downs at the same time. So some years, like the juncos, are probably moving farther south than others. You get a little blip, but those those two lines from here out are almost synchronous. So two different sen sets of data: one from December, one from February. It's kind of cool to see. Why are these things declining? We're not really sure. It could have something to do with climate change affecting habitats in the far north. The Arctic is warming faster. Permafrost is thawing. Also, some terrible things are happening up there. The core winter range for the species is the Midwest, where Agricultural intensification is reducing potentially shrubby habitat edges that they like to do. No one's really sure, but they're certainly a lot less common than they were back in the 60s. Could it be that they're not coming south as much? 
Probably not. Um, that's a good question. I should look into that. I did a study with Junko several years ago where I looked at data from like the Carolinas versus New England. And in the years we had lost down here, there were fewer down there. So there was that cycling up and down. So that's, uh, uh, there's not, I don't look that up. Maybe I'll do that by tomorrow. So I can, but, Anyway, that's a good theory. You get extra points. <laughs> All right, what's this one? I'm not sure. Is that this side of the room is way better. Now, what's the, what's, what's the story with these guys? They're invasive. They're not native. They're from England and Europe. They were brought over because they were friendly. They are very friendly, but they also mean. Um, they will feed up other cavity nesting birds. The good news is at my house, my feeder is in the back. The house sparrows are in the shrubs in the front. They almost never go in the back, so I've never had my feeders. But um, there's their trend, nothing fancy. Um, if you look at breeding bird survey data, however, these guys are declining. Um, they're also declining in Europe, where they're native, and people, they think that's habitat loss there. So the fact that these guys might be declining, at least in the breeding species in, in the Northeast, if we're losing invasive, what are we doing wrong? <laughs> Because everything else is declining as well. Oh, there's it's the same graph. Oh, that's per observer. You can see the decline a little stronger at the beginning of it. All right. Yeah, there's a, they got that buzzer. <laughs> house fish. Now, what's the story with house fishes? Anybody know the story of house fishes? It's an interesting one. Not really invasive. They're also not native. They are native to the West. So all the house finches in the east are descended from an escaped batch of them in the early 70s at LaGuardia. <laughs> it was illegally bringing house finches over. They left the cage out on the tarmac, and there are now house finches everywhere in the east that have actually met the populations of the west somewhere in Kansas. Um, they were already increasing here by the time we started this. They were getting to enter in the 70s, so you can kind of see um, that. But what's more interesting is when you kind of can, you adjust it, you see, so again, they're already here. And then in the mid, early mid 90s, there's this tank. If you remember this, and what was going on? So, oh my God, you can stump the left hand side. This was disease. This was salmonella, the conjunctivitis, or both. And you people probably heard about the house ridge eye disease where they get the little crusties on their eyes and stuff. You're supposed to bring your feeders in, clean them, blah, blah, blah. So that's pretty widespread, but this was salmonella, which obviously is more academic. And it basically took out a huge number of house fishes, and they haven't recovered. They're still around, not as many. So they were probably very, very inbred. They're all descended from the same couple of dozen birds that got loose of New York City and had high resistance, didn't have high resistance to this thing, took a bunch of them out, and they just, they're still recovered. You can see the same kind of graph that I didn't have here for when West Nile appeared with crows. Because crows were susceptible to West Nile, they had a drop, and they've started slowly getting back up and house which have not. And then they have this one, which is the opposite, right? The opposite. The purple fish, state bird. Ups and downs, it's another eruptive, it's a northern species. So what are all the general 10, if you look at other data, is for a decline that shows up better. Whoops. Okay, we'll get to that. So this is the comparison. This is one of each. Which one is which? Purple on the right. Okay, how many people say purple on the right? This is there's no you're not gonna get graded on this. Okay, raise your hands. Who says purple on the left? Everybody else is just afraid to even guess. <laughs> because they're, well, purple. So if you look back at these, there's purple. It's got this, notice how it's got the purplish pink color on the back um, and relatively few streaks. If you look at a house finch, lots of streaks and, and much less overall. You don't see the back of it. The purple finches are the raspberry ones. These look pretty similar because of the, probably because of the way the light is. The purple finch has. The color on the back, not as many streaks. Look at the streaks underneath there. So that's a house finch, purple finch. So this is where you can compare the two of them. You get some really fun things. Um, <laughs> so this will be the quiz at the end. Okay, which graph do you remember the most? The one with 14 lines on it. So again, the back to where the birds may doesn't go back very far. So this is 
um, Christmas count and breeding birth survey data going back into the into the 60s. And you can see the house finches were not here. Up they came. Boom, salmonella, boom, down they go. Um, purple finches, general decline on breeding season stuff, which is somewhat correlated with the rise in house finches. And there is a theory that house finches were competing with purple finches in the winter. And there was data saying that they were more aggressive, they'd be dominant over purple finches and feeders and so forth. So that could be a little bit behind that decline in purple finches. And then of course they just they tank, the purple finches love a lot. So that's a little further corroboration of that theory. Another PhD thesis from the wants to collect the whole set. You can also see the house finch rise and fall in the Christmas time data. So that's just a fun little use of data. The battery's gonna go on this thing. All right, another quiz. Anna Siskin. <laughs> Fine Siskin up here, American Dolphin here. Um, my systems are a little eruptive bird from part of the north. There is its pattern up, down, up, down, up, down, flat, up, down, little up, down, up, down. There seems like their eruptions have gotten less predictable. Goldfinches, which we didn't have all year, right, are also highly eruptive. Um, this year they're going to be down. They already are. I've noticed it. So there is where they were. So these guys are responding to birch seeds up in Canada. These guys are responding to something else um, and they'll move out a little bit during the, the colder months if there's not food. Yeah. Is that one person says it all the time on the left? I can't really be sure. It's a couple of you, I know. This is a common red pole. One of the most reliable eruptive species there is. Although, again, the eruptions have gotten a little less convenient in the last few years for some reason. This year was supposed to be a red pole year. Um, and it's, there's a few of them up north. Um, they're seen mostly farther west of like upstate New York and the Great Lakes area seems to have more red poles this winter than the New England there and it got. So maybe they just shifted west as they came south. But they're famous for this biannual thing. There's definitely more here this year than last year, but they have not made it south of the White Mountains in any significant manner. Whereas in some in good years, there'll be hundreds of them flying around, you know, even the coast. <laughs> These are the evening gross peaks. Who remembers the days of the evening gross peaks when they were like everywhere? They clean out your feeder in five seconds. Um, those were those days. <laughs> um, and they um, um, this sort of thing. No, okay. So let's talk about evening gross peaks. Evening gross peaks weren't here in the 60s, they showed up. Late 60s, early 70s, peaked in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and then crashed. And what they're doing is that they're a specialist on spruce bunworm, these little moth caterpillars that eat spruce and fir up in the northern forest. And those are outbreaks of bunworm which take are on average every 40 years, they'll last for a couple of decades when they're out there, and the growth speak just increase like gangbusters. They're the last one, and barely starting to notice something here compared to there. There's another outbreak in Quebec right now that's been going on for about five to 10 years. And again, the gross peaks are fairly common in some parts of the state this year, but mostly north and west. They haven't gotten down to the you know, lowlands and the Merrimack River this direction. But they are, there is a slight increase in gross peaks happening in the next few years because of that, probably because of that bottom up there. Um, and that bottom up just started. It could go another 20 years, in which case we might see something close to this, or again, might not, because other factors are at play. They, if they spray the hell out of the budworm to save their trees, that's gonna have an effect as well. No, left. Oh, did I stop everybody? No, no, we don't have those in the winter. This is winter, the winter berries. Although there's a Western tanager about three miles down the road right now. Um, oh my goodness. Done. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> this is a pine gross peak. Um, another northern finch. This one eats fruit. What well, is the seeds of fruit? Um, and again, like the red poles, bing, 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 and it's less busy, but still bing, 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 up and down in the recent years. Again, this is a pine gross peak year. 
but again, they're most mostly warm. This is food treatment warm, are pretty reliable right now. I haven't really made it to the seacoast or southern part of the state at all this year. They're usually synchronous with vegetables. And one of these two guys. Which one is Bohemian? Which one is cedar? Okay, who says cedar's on the right? Who says cedar's on the left? Cedar. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, well, luckily, there's no cookies in place. So you're <laughs> cedar waxes whoops, have yellowish on the tail. <laughs> These guys have um, rusty, and they've got white in their wings. Cedars don't have any color in their wings. Um, a few other differences. Cedars are around all year. They come and go. They're, they're very mobile. Bohemians, like the pine grass beak, are eruptive. And you'll see that same thing. Bohemian waxwings um, up and down, up and down. Cedar waxwings, like, all over the map. You know, they're just following the food. So the Bohemians come south when there's no food in Canada. They'll hang out in crab apple trees and other ornamentals. Cedars just wander around. I haven't seen, I've seen cedar waxwing once since early November. Um, OK, twice. I saw some the other day, I saw a whole bunch of Laconia just a couple weeks ago. So they're around, but they're not predictable at all. When summer comes, they got here, they start nesting, they'll stick around and then they're pretty reliable. But in the winter, the numbers that you have are totally dependent on what's going on for food crops. And they will just cover huge areas of land, just finding food and wandering around. They don't really stuck to a given location like your chickadees and stuff like that. There are two more birds in each group that we're gonna talk about. Any guesses what they are? Make this predictive now. Robins. Robins is one of them. Bluebirds. Oh, whoops, I forgot. Yeah, Bluebirds is the other one. So, chop right inside. <laughs> this is just a little, this is a fun picture because it's got the human waxwings and the pine rose beak in it. I didn't, I figured out the picture I've taken. I did not take this one. But there you can see the waxwing, the pine rose beak. Boom, 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 boom. Very, very synchronous. Not always the same magnitude. And then pine rose beak come right <clears throat> So these synchronous. So these these things are responding to these synchronous plant seeding events in the north. So why are plants doing that? Let's ship away from birds for a tiny bit. So what's why are these why are you know big mountain ash and birches in Canada producing seed only every other year? Why are spruce cones doing that every other year? Stress you know, the trees to produce fruit. Wow. Someone said something about stress on the trees to produce partially. The other thing is that they're trying to keep the squirrels from eating all the food. So if you think about like pine cones or acorns or any things that have really distinctive biannual cycles, if if you're a squirrel, you go, yes, there's acorns or yes, there's things I'm going to cover. And if you're if you're in a plant, you don't want the squirrels eating all of them. So you won't produce so many, they can't eat them all. They'll bury a bunch and be okay. If you produce the level amount, they eat more of them every year, you decrease your chances of successfully germinating some offspring. So they, the theory is that most masting in plants, probably less so in things like birch, is, is partially driven by rodents that are driving the whole system. All right, here's the other one we're talking about. There's a robin having some fine time with its, with its crab apples. And robins, you may have noticed, We've been here long enough. Did not used to be a winter bird. They're the sign of spring. Well, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> all, year, all year long, some numbers or another, um, they vary. Um, they went this huge peak in you know 2010 to 15, dropped again. Then last year they decided, okay, we're we got to keep up with the bluebirds. But they're they're basically you know is it because we planted more fruit? Is it because the climate's a little warmer? We really don't know, but robins have definitely increased as a winter bird, but nothing compared to these guys. Mm -hmm. Speaking of weird ones, it's a mountain bluebird over in Newington recently as well. There's weird western stuff around. And this is what bluebirds have done. They are just taking over the world. Again, no longer a sign of spring. They are just here all year long. Um, south of the whites, don't forget north of the whites, there's not many bluebirds in the winter, any. But you know, they're, the last few years, there have been look at the numbers that's 2,500 to 3,000. You know, bluebirds have been more abundant than the robins on this count for the last five years because they will come to feast. They will come to suet. They will they'll come to people mealworms out. They love those. Robins are going to be hanging out if there's like some food in your yard. So these guys are just another cool success story. Oh, there's there. I have it. There's a comparison to both of them. You know, bluebirds are outnumbering robins for the last several years. 
Robin's was trying to, Robin was got wind of this last year. <laughs> and I said, okay, you guys got to show up on people's yards on this 11th of February. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so this is, you know, another feeder bird, some people. And like we would probably do, they are slowly taking over the world. Look, there were none. Who knows the turkey story for New Hampshire? There were none. There were none. Yeah. They were extirpated back, you know. Why has everybody got the same song? Everybody likes the who. Um, it's okay, I'm not picking on them now. Poor guy. So yeah, they were brought back in the 70s. The fishing game introduced turkeys. It's a couple of pounds in New Hampshire. They're re bringing back turkeys back. Well, they that succeeded admirably. And turkeys are now just, you know, everywhere. Okay. What is this? Okay, that's start. Good start. Someone said it. This is a Cooper's hawk. Large Cooper's hawk. Long tail, white tip. Eats birds. It's got Junko, I believe, and my feeder. They love their little birdies. When I moved to New Hampshire, Cooper's hawk was listed as a threatened species. And I said, that's garbage, because I see them all the time. They just had updated the threatened the species list for a few years. Because this is what Cooper thought to do. You can see they were scarce. They were probably victim of DDT because they're a predatory bird. They eat things that have got contaminated, blah, blah, blah. They were scarce, but you know, they've just slowly been going up. Um, not a lot of them compared to chickadees because if there were that many, if there were as many Cooper thoughts as chickadees, there'd be no chickadees left. So, but this species has been rebounding rather nice. Now then. Oh, oh, yes, they're gone. They beat you. <laughs> Barn owls are fun. Who's seen barn owls in their feeders? They like sunflower seed or millet? So what are they eating at feeders? The rodents that are the underneath. rodents underneath. <laughs> um, especially when it gets harsh winter weather and it's a lot of snow or ice covering up the ground, they need some place to find easy food. The little critters, red squirrels and smaller, hang out in their feeders will get eaten. So there's the data for the back of the bursary. Again, this is this is per observer, so it's like you know, if you're lucky, you'll see. You know, one in five people sees a barn owl. I think it actually might be one in five times 10, so it might be one in 50. So you don't, we don't see many barn owls. So if you standardize the data, you show that they actually are increasing, which is also shown in other data sets. But they also go up and down a lot. That same up and down almost perfectly matched in Christmas time data. So look at that peak, 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 peak almost peak. Those are together, those are together. So this is the result of rodent population. Going up and down. When the rodent populations are high, the owls produce lots of kids in the summer. All those baby owls are looking for places to eat. They will show up in people's yards looking for places to settle and eat. Sometimes they're along, if you see them along roadsides, um, and so forth. So the barred owls, it's a little bit synchronous, just like the rodents are, just like the trees are, everything else is. So that's just a fun little story. Um, yeah. You guys are getting better, so I'm just not looking at them anymore. <laughs> Also increasing. You know, this is a species that's thought of as a forest interior bird. They like big old trees, lots of woods. Well, you see them in your yards. I see them in like we're downtown Concord sometimes almost. So they've adapted to our fragmented ecosystems and are just doing quite well. All right. Now these are some rare things. That don't show up here very often. It's fun to talk about rare birds because that's what birders like to do. These are all of these species that show up on the back of the winter at some point. There's not going to be a graph for them because they're not annual and usually there's only one or two. So, what is that? Hermit thrush. That's a hermit thrush. This is a, these, this is a representative of a group of birds we call the half hardies. They winter in reasonable numbers south of Long Island. And as our climate is warm, they're getting more and more common farther north and sticking longer in the winter. I saw one two weeks ago in Chilton. Um, I think on the seacoast, we have two or three of them, at least on the Christmas bird counts. Um, so they're just becoming more common in winter. It's all along with things like sapsuckers and coeys and catbirds, all of which are birds of winter as far north as the mid Atlantic states. And as our winters are getting milder, you know, they're not so much a feeder bird, but they will come to fruit and stuff, but they just get a little more common as you go north. So, yeah, I feel like this is what I'm going to stump you on, right? RBJ. No, it's not even round. It actually looks like a black throated blue. It is a black throated blue. 
This plant is a warbler. It's a right for you to always go on. There, you know, these are birds, little warblers that spend the winter in the Greater Antilles. I work on, with a colleague studying them in Jamaica in the winter. So they're not supposed to be here at all. Unlike the hermit arch, which at least is nearby. But every now and then, a black footed blue warbler or some other random bird gets its compass messed up and it ends up here, found a feeder, and it visits this woman's feeder, pursue it every day for the whole winter. Similar kind of story to this one. <laughs> There you go, that's the species. It's actually called the disheveled aura. This is a young, no, it's a young male Baltimore. Um, <laughs> show up in a feeder in Concord a couple of years back. So it's just like the warbler, they're supposed to be in the tropics somewhere and their compasses are messed up or they get confused and they and they end up in all three of these. All you know, that bird is in my yard on the back of whatever bird. I mean, this was somebody else's, this was somebody else's. Um, a bunch of followed pictures. All these birds have shown up on the back of a bird show. And finally. This is this is the clincher. Oh, yeah. The very thrush. Oh yeah, I thought you if anyone's gonna it's gonna be you. This is a very thrush. These things are from the Pacific Northwest. Oh, wow. Wow. And it was lost. And it showed up a feeder in Dunbar. Um, and every couple of years there's one there was one in Pittsburgh um, just late December. So random stuff that's not supposed to be around shows up every now every year on the Christmas tree, whether it's a thing that's supposed to be a little farther south. But not too far. It's supposed to be somewhere else. It's something that's not even supposed to be in this half of the continent. Um, as I mentioned, there's a western tanager in Greenland and a mountain bluebird in New England this week still. So there's, these birds have compass errors and they show up places, they find place, find food, berries in this case, and they're fine. <clears throat> okay, one more quiz. There's no graph. This is just a refresher for all the birds to look at. There are three species in this picture. Just to keep you on your toes. Any guesses? Someone, I heard someone say something. Which one is a junko? This one? Yeah. Yay, junko, point to the right. <laughs> is that, unless the left said it, they didn't say a lot. That's all that no sparrows. What's that one? No goldfinch. Pine siskin. And these are um, red pulse. Um, so that's just a little mix, you know. During a fun, fun winter finch year, you can get all sorts of stuff in your same feeder. So I'll leave this up here. People can write it down if they want to. Um, but I also have, I think that's the last slide. Yes. Um, the back of the bird survey is February 11th and 12th this year, so a little less than a month from now. Cornell also has something called the Great Backyard Bird Count, which is I think the week later this year. Similar project. Um, and then there's also something much longer term that you do like weekly called or bi-weekly called Project Feeder Watch. And all these are collecting data that you can collect in your yard as a community scientist um, that helps us understand what bird populations are doing and just keep on piling those data in and go from there. And with that, I can open it up. I have plenty of time. People with their random bird questions or anything else that they might want to ask. <laughs> What about snowy owls this year? Are they around much? Or? Not many. There's been one hanging out in Hampton. There's also yeah. one in like Orange County, California, which is yeah. taking the New York Times. <laughs> but yeah, they, they did not move much. They did not move in big numbers this year, probably because they felt all the yummy stuff mm -hmm. in the yard. They don't come to the feeders ever. <laughs> questions? Other questions? Not, not so much about I think it was the birds, but there was a, a big outbreak of caterpillars and moths up in the Conway area. Oh yeah, the gypsy moth. Oh, not a lot of safe gypsy moth, right? So that's why I didn't say it. Yeah, it's spongy moth. Uh, the, uh, and what effect does that have? How does that affect the bird population? Do they eat them or it doesn't seem like they eat them? Very few things eat, eat those fuzzy, those are hairy caterpillars. They've got like nasty irritating hairs, but cuckoos love them. Black bill and yellow bill cuckoos, they actually have a cool digestive system that they, they eat those caterpillars. They will show up in the areas where those caterpillars are. They're like they're like the wax ones. So, oh, I, I, I think I hear caterpillars eating. And they zip over there. No. Um, and they'll just chow down on them. They actually can regurgitate their stomach linings once they get all covered with hairs and then sort of 
like the mucus layer on the inside. So they just, that's how they're adapted to deal with these irritating hairs. So cuckoos do this with respect to those caterpillars. Of course, then the caterpillars are gone. Very few things eat those. So the main problem is going to be what does that mean to the trees that other things are using? But as far as bird, direct bird reflex, the, the, the prosy caterpillars, spongy moth caterpillars, and so on are cuckoos. Thank you. You're very welcome. Have you seen any effects from the avian flu continuing or? Uh, avian flu does not really get these things. Yeah. You know, like avian flu is affecting waterfowl and larger things like eagles. Yeah, you know, I was just thinking in general ups. if you noticed anything, if it's still persistent. Of it's still around. It's, I, haven't, I haven't heard any updates from New Hampshire into things, but I was, you know, I was at a meeting last week with a whole bunch of people from all over the East. And North Carolina is dealing with a like massive cormorant and the pelican die out from it. Um, Farther southeast, there were eagles, you know, and, and vultures. That were, you know, it was actually a black vulture roost somewhere in Georgia, I think it was. And they were, you know, come back to roost at night and occasionally one would die, right? Because they had avian flu. Then there was a roost that beat that one and they get avian flu and they had like hundreds of dead vultures. Mm -hmm. The waterfowl, um, water birds, and, you know, scavengers are what's mostly being affected by avian flu mm -hmm. and people's chickens, obviously. All the eagles. Does the female have a white head also? Yes. We did before the start of your first four of us were out on the discovery center and there was a big bird, but didn't have a yeah. white head. So bald eagles take six years to get a white head. And so in between there, you got one, two, three, four, five year olds that have various, they start off very dark brown overall. A bit of white near the tail and the wings, and then they get paler by five. They look more like it was almost like some weird smudges, and then they're fully capable of breeding. So it takes five, five or six years to get a white head on the bald eagle. And people are actually, you know, you probably heard about the bald eagle increase, right? Bald eagles used to be like very, very rare. Um, I believe this past summer, my colleague, they had over 80 nests in the state, and in 1989, there was one. So I like to say that bald eagle are vermin. Sometimes <laughs> um, just a jab at my colleague. But bald, the same bald eagle increase that we're seeing with actually <clears throat> counting every single one nesting in the state, we can see that increase in going back to when the birds were there, which is kind of funny, you know, because these are just, oh, I saw an eagle flying over my house, um, which people see, and there's enough of them that more of them are being seen, and we can actually see the eagle increase, even though data that's not even some scientific eagles. <laughs> Do some birds travel in flocks primarily and some are more solitary? Yes. You know, there's certain, you know, that's, that's, yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it varies by, you know, something like waterfowl are flocking birds, waxwings and siskins are flocking birds, warblers are not, although they will. And during migration, it's a very, very variable thing of species and season as to what, what the social behavior of a given species might be. So I guess a really good answer to that was just yes. <laughs> Any good stories from this year's migration at that moment? It wasn't very, it wasn't, it was kind of just average. I don't remember anything terribly exciting. Do you have any good, anybody else have any good stories? Do you have any good stories from this fall of migration? No, okay. Um, what happens when something like that mountain bluebird gets into the nest? Right now it is. <laughs> um, so there's two things that can happen. One, most of these small birds don't live more than two or three years. So there's chances of making it back to begin with, even if it was lost, even if it was wintering in Arizona where it's supposed to be, are still small. But we do know that some of these things come back. Um, we thought those things were weird. There was, a, there was a hummingbird in Newmarket until December 23rd wow. at a woman's feeder. A rufous hummingbird, a western hummingbird, not our ruby throat. Rufus hummingbird. The feeder was heated. It showed up. She put a heater on the feeder so it would have food. And it disappeared before the big Christmas storm. Probably because it said, oh shit. There's <laughs> 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 apparently there were other hummingbirds. There was one in Maine. There was a Connecticut. There's like three or four other really weird Western hummingbirds in New England. And they all disappeared at the same time. So the optimist in us says, oh, they saw the storm coming and said, I'm leaving. The, op the pessimist says, the hummingbirds in December in New England, they're not going to live. We don't know what happened. We do know that several years back, a hummingbird that showed up in somebody's yard in Western Massachusetts was banded, survived the winter, and came back the next year. 
So once your compass is messed up, you don't fix it. And you're going to do this instead of this. So if that non mover lives, there's a reasonable chance it'll be back in New England and they'll have needle in the haystack. <laughs> um, but yeah, these once they've got a messed up compass, they tend to stick around and do the same thing wrong twice. Back and then front. What specifically defines an irrational high rise? Well, the lava built oh wait. <laughs> <laughs> so it's basically these highly um, variable peaks and valleys. So when they're rough, is when they, they actually come south. So normally we have very few of these things, if any, in the winter, and then we get them. That's what's called the rupture because they've all moved out of Canada. What makes that? Is it specific amount? It's just the actual presence. There's actually you almost never any in the off years, okay. or they're they're still still in southern Canada, and it's it's highly subjective, of course. Like last year, there were a few juncos around. I mean, red falls. But yeah, it's just really it's, the magnitude is is very usually very obvious. Yep. Okay. The next one in front. Well, that's the birds using their compass, and then what do they do? Just similar to that tropical sea bird. Yeah. Seeing, not seeing them. Does anybody know what happened to that? That's not there. So either it died or it's figured yeah. out something else. It was around for like a couple of weeks. Yeah. But yeah, you know, all these crazy birds that birders love to chase are basically doomed. Yeah, they're in the wrong place. Yeah. So it's kind of a it's kind of a macabre little hobby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it probably is. You know, people have you know it's hard to study these things because there's not many of them. But someone mm -hmm. did a captive study with black pole warblers. I have a whole other talk on migration. Maybe they'll invite you back for that one sometime. <laughs> um, you know, black pole warblers they nest in Alaska. I'm going to do this backwards so you can see. They migrate east across North America to here, and then they go south and then across the Caribbean to South America. Perfectly normal thing. Every year, there's a bunch in California, which is the opposite direction. If you're going to go that way and keep going southwest, you're in the Pacific Ocean and you're not getting to South America at all. You're, you're tuna food, that's what I call them. They <laughs> caught them, they put them in a little cage where you can measure what, they wanted, what their orientation is. And they still want to go southwest, where if you catch one in the northeast, it's going southeast. So it's got what's called a mirror image misorientation, where their compass is off by 90 degrees off of the north south axis. And so those birds that are going the wrong direction to some degree are actually have a little flip on the switch that just did something wrong and they just end up in the wrong place. And sometimes birds get blown off course and they do that. There's lots of different reasons for why a bird's in the wrong place, but lots of times it probably has to do with some misorientation thing. Let's see. When, when we hear a lot about night lights, like electrical ones, yeah. affecting these birds' migration, how much is that showing up in what you've been showing us? Well, not with this at all, because these things aren't very much. We don't like them. Well, this is a few, though. I'm going to mention this thing. Um, we, we don't have very much data on how light pollution is affecting bird populations because it's it's hard to study. We do know that it affects bird migration. You know, people have people heard of the there's a thing, a 9-11 thing, the tribute in light. And they shoot these two super intense beams up out of out of where the World Trade Center used to be. And people from New York City Audubon will monitor those beams. You can see the birds in them. Because the birds get attracted to those lights and get stuck in there because they get all confused. So they turn the lights off for 10 minutes or something, and the birds disperse and they do it again. So light pollution is a, definitely a thing. It, it, under certain conditions, it causes mortality. But single localized mortality events are really hard to correlate with long-term population trends. You know, that's usually due to habitat losses or disease, or something that operates on a larger scale. But that was just my reminder. If you haven't heard of this and want to, this is a couple years old now, the thing we wrote, State of the Birds, that talks about population trends, threats, conservation actions for birds. In New Hampshire, and I bought a box of them if anyone wants one. One per household. We don't have infinite supplies if you wanted to grab one. Um, but this is a resource that's a little more conservation focused, like you started getting into there. And also, as I said, there's um, other stuff back there. Oh, you said you had two, yeah. didn't you? I'm sorry. That was my cue, though. How do they know that? They've got little, they get their phones 
<laughs> and they say, okay, where can I? And then they'll say, what group? And no, they, they are, these, most birds that are doing that are flocking birds. So they will be big flocks and they might spread out over an area as they move south until someone finds it. And then they maybe come back to the same area and then one of them will lead them to that. Essentially is how that's probably believed to occur with some of these, very, like you asked me before about flocking birds. You know, most of these things that are seeking out highly concentrated food supplies are birds that do it in flocks. Otherwise individuals like this random Oriole will find a random fruit tree and say, okay, I'll eat this fruit. But otherwise it's, it's the little flock dynamics. So the trees will come back and do a dance and teach the other trees. They probably just have little calls or something that they do. They, 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 they can talk, right? So. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Um, we're right outside Great Bay, and we have a lot of grass ducks right now. Yeah. Can you just do a quick overview of what kind of ducks are likely to be seen? It's sort of hard to tell they're black. Yeah, there, there's tons of them out there. There's yeah, also, there are 2,500 greater stop out there right now. There are probably equally, there's probably hundreds, if not a thousand, black ducks. There's mallards. There's golden eye, there's bufflehead, there's American widgeon, there's at least one redhead. Um, there there's a few hoodies, there's some red breasted mergansers. There's probably a couple of common mergansers, usually in the rivers, like the swamp scot. I get attacked by a diorama. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's the that's the general mix right now. Bufflehead, I said bufflehead, so yeah, that's what's out there for ducks. It seems like birds come to the feeders all different times, but around the same time. It's the they see what time? In the morning, usually. Yeah, right. So why why would you go to the feeder in the morning? Because you're hungry. What did, did you eat all night? There you go. The morning they just spent all night in the winter in the cold burning all the food they ate yesterday. And they will be more active, they'll, everything will be more active in the morning, then they'll just gonna be more sporadic after that. But yeah, so the first thing in the morning, they're they're out of food, they need to refuel. It's like we do, yeah. go to Duncan. <laughs> you didn't mention crows and ravens. What do you wanna know? We do see them. I didn't mention all sorts of things actually. But yeah, I mentioned crows. What did I say about crows? This is a quiz. Because of nope. When I see you were listening. No one was listening. That's a waste of my time. <laughs> West Nile. So crows were do, 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 do. they were uh, bloom, and then they kind of go back up again. I don't have a graph. Ravens are doing this. Ravens are like turkeys. Ravens did not used to be down as part of the state at all. Ravens used to be a rare bird up in the north and the whites. And over the last 20, 30 years, they've just said, okay, I can nest on a water tower, and they've basically shown up all, you know, you see ravens in ports. And fish crows are moving up? Fish crows are moving north. They still migrate out in the winter. So there's very few winter records of fish crows unless you live in Salem, <laughs> which apparently is a little hotbed of fish crow wintering. <laughs> so yeah, that's another one of these, you know, give us another 20 years, I'll have a graph for fish growing here, but I also won't be working for it. So someone else will have to show that graph. I hope I'm not working for 20 years from now. It's going to be yeah, whatever. Yeah, they just <laughs> yeah. the starling graph is kind of boring. Starlings are another species that's in decline. Yeah. Um, <laughs> people think it might be because of agriculture being less common and less, you know, seeds and cow poop and things like that or barns. But yeah, I don't spend much time thinking about them. Sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, it varies. Like you think about geese, right? I mean, you watch geese flying, the one of them will shift, they'll shift because it's harder work being in the front. Right. For everything else that's in the big blobs, you know, within a, within a cluster feeding, though, it's going to be higher. When they're flying around, there's probably not. But if they're at a feeder, there's a bunch of birds, there'll be some that are dominant over other birds, say like juncos, usually the males are dominant over the females, the older birds are dominant over the younger birds. So, yeah, birds will, birds will do that. Um, they just do stuff, yeah. If you have a flock of ducks out there, they probably don't fare. Um, but yeah, sometimes it's not, usually there's a dominant sparky if they're at a resource, otherwise they just fly around. Okay, I exhausted all your questions. Any other questions? Before we say goodbye, just a couple of things. So we have a couple more lectures coming up, February and March, um, also about birds. Um, February, saltmark sparrows. 
And our um, graduate research fellow that's working at the reserve is going to be giving that talk, Grace. And then March is the resurgence of bald eagles, and that will be um, Pam's um, yeah, I I co worker, Chris Martin. Will be so you can, if well. you come to that one, just give him heck about eagles, eagles are firm, and why are eagles? Yes, yep. So, um, yes, I do know them, but I don't, I can't remember. Right okay. But I'll, I'll get them to you guys. Um, and the, the flyers on the front door, registration for those two lectures as well, the same way you registered for this lecture. And then also Pam did mention the bird feeder kind of guideline. So general rule is bird feeders can be up, you know, kind of December through March. Um, and, you know, as part of Fish and Game, we really support that guideline because you don't want to attract what to your yard? Bear. Bear. Giant squirrels. And in the summer, you know, plant native plants, put out bird baths, things like that are going to keep the birds in your yard. So you'll still be able to see them. And I have a bird feeder in my second floor window all summer long because the bears can't climb a vertical surface. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, window feeder. Awesome. Does anybody have any other questions? Has anybody seen a bear recently? It's been warm enough if there's a few around in the southern part of the state. Well, well, thank you, Pam. That was you're great. very welcome. Thank you, guys.